Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's our post-trade deadline episode, and Matt, I don't know about you, this is one of my favorite episodes we do every year. I'm Dan alongside Matt. Let's break down this deadline, shall we, Matt? Yeah, at least we didn't lose to a Zamboni driver this week, so that's a positive. Well, let's look at those (laughs) games first then. No Zamboni drivers, but the best team in the league was here on uh, February 21st, Friday night. The Calgary Flames took on the Boston Bruins in the Dome, and Calgary ended up dropping this game 4-3 to the Bruins in regulation. Let's start with you. What were some of your thoughts on this game? Well, I thought the Flames came out flying, and obviously they did very well, scoring three goals in the first three and a half minutes, and then that was basically it for their compete level for most of the rest of the game. And Boston's too good of a team to respect, and I think that the Flames just could not get anything going at any point and Boston just kind of strangled the team off and Calgary just couldn't get anything going after that I think the fact that the Flames were at one point in this game up 2 nothing against the best team in the league does say something about these guys though I thought in the first period Boston gave the Flames a lot of really good ozone time and space and that's why the Flames were able to do what they did and while we lost I think this was one of those games where it was a respectable loss. And against the best team in the league, honestly, the Flames did not look as lost as I thought they were going to. No, and especially because of the fact that Boston, to me, is the team to beat in the playoffs. I think much like Tampa heading into the postseason looked at the most formidable of any of the teams, Boston seems to have that crown thus far this season. And... It, you know, there's no real weaknesses with the Bruins. And Calgary, they did get out to a good start, but they just couldn't beat them. And it's hard to beat good teams. Like, we remember back, at, even before we were doing this show, against teams like Chicago and L.A., uh, when they were good and cup contenders, like, those games were always a battle. And, like, if you actually won the game, it was, like, full marks to you because they're such a good overall team that you have to play your heart out just to get anything on those guys. And Calgary, I found, didn't quite rise to that occasion until the third period a bit, but... They just didn't have any answers for the team. They definitely made a push again in the third, and I thought it was interesting if you listen to some of the coaches' comments after the game and some of the players. The coach was very complimentary of his team, and I don't know if that's just, I mean, he used to work in Boston if he likes the Bruins or what it is, but I thought Jeff Ward very complimentary of his players and his team and their performance, but a lot of the players down on themselves for you know, losing to Boston and they had three days off before this. So it's just tough to get going. But again, I thought a, a pretty overall from an inconsistent Calgary flames team that we've seen all year. I thought a pretty respectable effort by this team. Yeah. And like if the flames were ever to meet a team like Boston in the uh, playoffs, I don't see how the, the the flames would come out on the winning side of it. I think it would look Uh, a lot like that Colorado series last year. Yeah, and I think that Calgary is going to have to learn to be more desperate. And I think that, like, that's part of the thing when you see teams beat, like, the better caliber teams, like Columbus last year. Columbus, they didn't, they knew that they were going to get smoked by the Lightning, and they didn't care, so they just played a loose, desperate hockey and ended up sweeping the Lightning, who were caught flat-footed. And Calgary needs to learn some lessons from games like this, where you have to elevate your level of desperation and like treat it like the last five minutes, and you're down by two goals throughout the game. And you know, attention to details all game. And like, if you're wanting any success in the postseason, or even to make the postseason, like, you're gonna have to elevate your game, and some of the players are, to their credit, doing that, but not enough, frankly, and 
it'll be interesting to see, especially with the rematch coming up this week, how the Flames fare and if they can learn any lessons from this game. Yeah, and we see them, um, by them I should say, the Boston Bruins. We, we play them again this week on Tuesday in Boston. So, like you said, it'll be interesting to see if there's any change to the Flames game or if they learn anything from this game in the Dome against Boston. But I thought after big wins against bad teams in California all week, this was a good measuring stick of what this team really is. Like the week before, it was all those big wins that we talked about against teams that are not good teams. So I thought, okay, let's see what these guys have against the best in the league. And and I got about what I expected. Yeah, and Calgary, especially moving forward, as the season progresses and as we're, you know, like now, of the next 14 games, 12 of them are against teams that are in the hunt for the postseason. So there's not going to be too many easy teams. And in order to make the postseason, Calgary will have to play desperate hockey. And up to this point in the season, we haven't really seen that effort level from them. And it'll be interesting to see if they can find that next gear, especially with several teams stocking up at the trade deadline from our division. We'll get to the deadline a little bit and talk about some of those and their impact, but let's talk about the other game this week first. So the next game, the Flames go from best to worst. They start their five-game road trip against the Detroit Red Wings. This is a trip that'll last all week. And I think we got what the Flames probably should have got out of this game, especially you know after the Boston game and a big 4-2 to two win for the Flames against Detroit. Things looked a little shaky at the beginning, I thought, for the Flames in this one. But overall, you know, you're playing the worst team in the league. The Flames did what they had to do. Is there much more to say about this one, Matt? Well, uh, the score could have been better. But, you know, it's one of those where, like, I think even if the Flames sat out a bunch of people, they would have still beat them. Like, Detroit's not a very good team. No, and there, you know, there's some teams this year that were put together properly and just haven't performed or bad injuries like San Jose. This was a deliberately bad team. These guys are going through a rebuild. And, you know, we saw, as we have in the last little bit, goals from Manjapani, our depth scoring. You know, he got uh, we got Johnny Goudreau on the board, Sean Monaghan on the board, which has become more and more common to see Goudreau scoring last little bit. But, you know, we got depth scoring. We got our top line scoring. I, I just, when I look at this one, the Flames look like a playoff team playing the worst team in the league. There's yeah. not much else to say, um, I don't think. No. Riddick looked good. Um, I thought a little bit shaky maybe in the first, but definitely calmed down as the game went on. Yeah, it's kind of hard to have a bad game against Detroit, unless you're Montreal, who lost all four meetings this year for some reason. You know what? I thought, though, if if there's a team you're going to lose to this week, just because we know how the Flames tend to play down to their opponents, this could have been the game. Yeah, well, I was worried about that, so I'm glad that the Flames actually showed up enough to get the two points. Yeah, because you, you you don't want to like, especially heading into the trade deadline. It's like, yeah, uh, that kind of sends signals that to the GM, hey, maybe we should sell <laughs> instead of you know even thinking about doing anything. Yeah, no, for sure. Um. After that game, I think the you know the Calgary Flames had a decent week overall. Uh, one win, one loss. But as you mentioned, going into the deadline, I have to imagine there's a few other things maybe on some guys' minds after that Detroit game. But either way, it pushed the Flames back into a wild card spot. The Flames now sit 70 points, tied with Arizona. Calgary's in wild card one, and Arizona wild card two. Vancouver's at 72 points, Edmonton at 73 points, is second in the Pacific, and then Vegas, the Pacific Division leader, at 76 points. So, as has been the story for most of the season, the Flames are in it, but also very close to being out of it at the same time. I mean, we've got Winnipeg at 69, Nashville at 68 right on our heels. These guys really have to keep a better than 500 pace from now on, I think, to stay in the playoff spot. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see, especially with uh, Vancouver losing Markstrom for a bit, that how they fare. Um, 
Calgary, their destiny is in their own hands. Like, Calgary was about, you know, a few points up on San Jose around this point last year and ended up winning the division by double digits. And, like, if Calgary can get some wins going and Vegas starts losing, we can still win the division. It just, you know, the Calgary has to get their stuff together and moving forward. And I think that... You know, if they're going to have a good end to the season and a good drive into the playoffs, that they need to start going sooner than later. And right now, I'm not sure that as Flames fans, we can really be, you know, hoping for number one. I mean, it'd be nice, but I think right now the goal has to just be stay in a playoff spot. Yeah, and frankly, like... uh, as weird as it sounds, I'd almost rather be second or third in the division and play either Vancouver or Edmonton in the first round than, you know, having a situation of a hot wild card team like last year. <laughs> you know, if you if you look at yeah. the Pacific, and I know we've talked about it, you especially this year, I really think if you can get into the top two or three in the Pacific, I'd say top two for sure, you have as good a chance as anybody to go to the third round. Yeah, because our division is so bizarrely bad. Every team's got some flaws. No team here is perfect. It's just a matter of who can win four out of seven. And I think any team can beat any other team in this division on any given night. Yeah, it's not like uh, years gone by like where Anaheim was clearly awesome or San Jose was clearly awesome and like everybody else in the division's just kind of there. Like there's no real clear-cut front runner and Calgary I think I still believe Calgary has the best overall talent level of any of the teams in the Pacific it's just getting them all pulling in the right direction at the same time and that's been the main obstacle for this team all season is <laughs> you know everybody going towards the same goal I at the was same talking time. to somebody this week and curious to get your thoughts on this would you rather the guys that Calgary has here got hot early and then trickled out or were sort of mediocre all year and then get hot near the end? Oh, by far. If you can go into the playoffs doing well, I would much rather that. Like, obviously, like, you'd rather be, like, Boston where you're just consistently awesome all season and then you just, you know, roll over everybody... Yeah, like, you have to have, like, everybody being good consistently, like Boston generally does, and, you know, have everything going the right way, And but I think that Calgary, if they can get hot at the right time, and, like, down the last 19 games of the season, if they can string together a couple of good 10-game segments that they can... Like, if they can win, say, 12 or 13 or 14 of those 20 games, including the Detroit game, like, that that would be a very good rush into the postseason. And I think that, you know, if Calgary can get on that kind of a streak, then, you know, we do have, in my opinion, the best talent pool of our division. It's just, you know... It, the which team's going to show up has been the, the Flames' problem all year. And we're starting to see Johnny going and Monty going. I agree with you. The guy I talked to this week actually thought the opposite, but I agree with you. I'd rather get hot just for the playoffs and try to ride that than cool down for the playoffs and try to get it going again. Well, we saw that last season where the Flames were, ba- and the Sharks, frankly, were just awesome for the first three quarters of the season. You knew they were going to be 1-2 in the division, And both teams took their foot off their gas. And, like, San Jose did end up getting to the conference finals, but, you know, they got smoked by St. Louis and had a tough time with both Vegas and Colorado. And, you know, Calgary had lost to Colorado because, like, they just, they didn't have that desperation. And I think that, like, where Calgary is right now, we need to be desperate in order to make the postseason. Like, we're only one point up on a playoff spot. So, you know, just to make it, you have to be giving it your all. And 
if the flames can do that, then they should be fine. Especially because, like, frankly, looking at the teams in our division, if we faced off against Edmonton, we stand a fairly good chance of beating them. Vancouver, same thing. Arizona, same thing. Vegas might be a bit of a difficult climb, but... I'd know, rather like, not play Vegas in the first round. Yeah. So, like, it, you know, like, any permutation with our division rivals, it's like, yeah, we could probably take them in the first Especially round. Especially now they have Robin Leonard. Oh, no. Well, let's talk about Leonard. Let's talk about this week. I think this is what everyone's waiting for. Um, trade deadline was today, and as always, some interesting moves made around the league. Um, we saw some... Just asking, uh, does that make Marc-Andre Fleury Batman? Batman and Robin? Batman Robin, yeah. Maybe. Don't they call him Flower? They could be like Flower and Robin, your new... Uh, your new Vegas crime fighting team, Ve- Vegas yes. puck stopping team. Yeah. Maybe we'll give him a cape at the practice facility. So anyway, back to the trade deadline. Uh, Flower and Robin are now in Vegas, but a lot of other players moving here. And I thought an interesting day for movement. I had a feeling there was going to be high prices because there weren't a lot of teams moving, but a lot more teams made moves than I thought. Um, we'll talk about some of the moves from other teams in a little bit and how they might affect the Flames. But the Flames make three transactions today. And if you listen to Brad Living talk after the deadline, he said that their focus changed in the last couple of weeks with some of the injuries to their defensemen. Um, it sounds reading between the line like they wanted to get some forwards and ended up getting some defensemen. But let's talk about these, these deals, and then we'll get some thoughts on them. The Calgary Flames moved their 2020 third-round pick to the Chicago Blackhawks to get Eric Gustafson, who is uh, 20, what is he, 27, Seven. 27, six foot, 197 pounds, current salary is 1.4 million. This is a guy coming off a career season last year at 50 points. Um, 60. 60, actually. you're right, 60 points. And I, I think a, a pretty overall as a middle, you know, pair defenseman, a good pick. Now, I saw some people criticize the third round pick in this one and maybe giving up too much. And I thought the same thing at first. But when I look at the Flames draft picks, this pick could easily be replenished by the Oilers. All we got to do is get James Neal score two more goals and we get the Oilers third. So Chicago will get whichever pick ends up being earlier in the third round this year. Um, Matt, do you want to give your thoughts on the Gustafsson pickup? Yeah, he's not a very good defensive defenseman. And, like, there's some games that... Great offensive like, defenseman. He's, he's just okay defensively. Others, he's like, uh, what are you doing out there? Who's worse in their all? own end, Gustafsson or Goudreau? Probably Gustafsson. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, Gustafsson and, or Aginla? Uh, probably goes to some, wow. but you know, it's, yeah, it, he's not very good defensively, but you know, he is a very good offensive defenseman. He scored 60 points last year, which for a defenseman is ridiculous. He was sixth overall in the league. Especially on a mediocre points. team like Chicago was. Yeah. And he's on pace for about 40, 35, 40 now. So, you know, like that would be obviously a very big shot in the arm for our power play and the flames have been lacking a true point man on the power play and i think that goofs i've always liked gustafson with chicago for the power play and i think that he'll be a very welcome addition and you know it, with his price tag like i don't see him being in a he's a ufa at the end of the year i don't expect him to be an expensive re-sign and calgary was actually interested in signing him prior to him going to chicago as you said he's not great in his own end he's got 26 points this year which i think without looking makes him the second highest uh point getter on defense for the flames this season yeah, like he's pretty good. And, and I think if you pair him up with the right partner, I'm thinking Hafen, who's got some more defensive responsibility, you might not have a bad pairing there. Yeah, or even Forbort, who we're going to be talking about in a minute, as on the third pairing. And, you know, it it just depends. I think you have to shelter Gustafson 
Or you could do what I've always wanted and, you know, solve your right wing problems by getting a defenseman up there and, you know, tell him to score. I, I think Tree already has enough issue with bringing in a left shot defenseman, much less taking a left shot defenseman and converting him to a right winger. Well, you never know. I, he does. Play, he can play on the right side defensively. Which I so. think is definitely a good thing for him. Um, I, I like this signing for what we gave up for him. I... I wouldn't be surprised if we see Gustafson back next season. Like you said, he's his uh, salary this year is one point four million. So you know, even at one point eight two million, I think I honestly could see Gustafson coming into Hamonic's spot in the lineup next year. Not saying they're the same player. Well, I you, you know I'm actually looking at the two acquisitions today. It, as basically like the bargain basement version of Brody and a Hamannick. Yeah, I can see that. Like if you were to replace those two with those two, you'd have to move somebody you know, else up the lineup then. But yeah, it gives you some yeah, sure. some veteran depth. And like you know, like it, especially like if you're expecting Valimaki to be in the NHL next season, you know, like you could get away with. Things like it, you know, a Hamannick or a Hannafin and Valimaki second pairing have Forbort with Gustafson as the third pairing and Anderson with Giordano. Like, that would be a very passable NHL defense. Matt, I think to me, the biggest thing about Gustafson that I like is, as you mentioned, this guy can quarterback the power play, and the Flames have needed that guy for a while. They've needed. Um, you know, a really offensive defenseman there. We sort of had Hamilton doing that for a while, but I think one of the best things about this guy is, like you said, yeah, he can be a defensive liability, but if they keep him around, I can see him being that really offensive defenseman these guys need. Yeah, and Calgary needs to uh, get some additional offensive weapons in their toolkit, and I think that having... Gustafson adds a element that the Flames have been lacking for a while now, and hopefully that can translate into some more power play goals, which that'll translate into more wins and points, so that, that would be a good thing. I don't think we can ever expect 60 points again from this guy, but it could be a useful defensive contributor. Well, like even if he's a adequate third-pairing guy, that can chip in 30 points or 35 or 40 points. Like, that's awesome for what, you know. I'd even take 20 from a third-pairing guy. Yeah, and, like, he's adequate. And, like, if you can get him to fill in... Because, like, honestly, at a re-sign, I don't see him being more than two and a half-ish million on a, like, two- or three-year deal. So, like, that's an adequately price depth defenseman for what this team needs and he's 27 so he fits with the age group better um gustafson is expected to join the calgary flames tomorrow in boston where they will be for obviously their game against the bruins and it's been announced here his calgary flames number he will wear number 56 do you remember when brian burke was here and everybody had to have a number under like 30 yeah i know and now we got 56, we got Shillington wearing 58, we got Manjapani with 88. Like, Burke's probably sitting in the studio in Toronto pulling out that long hair he's got slipped back. Yep. Ah, numbers! Ah. <laughs> you know, well, it's good to see some unusual numbers instead of the standard, like, 33, 44, 55, or, you know, in the single digits, so... And the next guy we're going to talk about is also expected to join the team tomorrow in Boston. He'll be wearing number 20, which feels like a forward number, not a defensive number. And that's Derek Forbort. Derek Forbort comes to us from the LA Kings. He was traded for a conditional fourth round pick in 2021. Um, just as a, as a note on how that condition works, if the Flames make the conference final this spring and Forbort plays half the games... The pick becomes a third in 2022. Or if he resigns with Calgary, it becomes a third in 2022. Or if Tree's nose is itchy on a Tuesday, after he's been in Boston, it becomes a fifth. No, I'm just kidding about the last part. But you get these really weird, weird conditions <laughs> on some of these picks. Um, LA is also eating 25% of Forbort's salary. So the Flames will be on the hook for $1.8 million. Um, this looks very similar in principle to the Oscar Fantenberg deal last year, done with the same team. What do you think of Forbort? 
uh, he's a very much a Derek England type guy. And Big heavy defenseman. Yeah, a nice six foot four, two hundred and twenty pound. Yeah, he, that's just exactly what the Flames need. And I think I, Brad Living today I, called him a long defenseman. Yeah, well, I would expect Forbort to be back. Frankly, I I liked Forbort when he was with uh, L.A. I think that he's a just a good rugged defenseman, and I think that the Flames need that size on the blue line and I think that's been one of the things that has been lacking since Derek England left like Hamannick's done a decent job but you know we need more than just one guy who's decent at that kind of game and Forbort can play up and down the defense pairings like he was with Drew Doughty this season so that's good so Forbort's uh, current cap hit 2.5 if you bring him back do you pay him anywhere near that? Oh, uh, probably in the you'd see him back around the three, three and a quarter mark at most. See, I think he's, I would start negotiating a, from the twenty five percent cap hit, which is one point eight. Yeah, well, he is coming off an injury, and his back's been a little wonky. So you know, we'll see. You know, I think that both Gustafson and Forbort were guys that the Flames were looking at. Uh, it for free agency so why not get them now while they can help you for the playoffs and see how they fit in with this team but I think that both these guys I put it this way I would not be surprised if uh, between now and July 1st that they both have contracts with the team well and even Brad Treliving said in his media availability today you're always looking at guys you bring in as potentially coming back here. I think you're right. I think Brad's looked at both these guys. They both have flaws and that's why you get them for a mid round pick. Like you said, Forboard's been hurt a lot this year. Um, but both these guys have played with good defensemen. Forboard's played with Dowdy, using Gustafson play a lot with Keith. Um, you know, some some guys you know how to step in the lineup and play well with top defenseman not i would call either one of these guys our top guy next year but guys that know how to play with top guys and and probably good depth pieces for this team i would say much better depth pieces than oscar fantenberg yeah fantenberg was okay but fantenberg you know, you're bringing the... in to be a number seven these guys you're not no and i like that's why i think that these guys could be part of this team next season uh, even like as like the third pairing uh, and have them as a, like cheaper alternatives to bringing back either Hammock or Brody and go from there like uh, frankly like I would expect both of them to sign for about five million dollars total uh, on the upper side of things and uh, which would free up say like Hammock's contract to go towards another forward instead yeah i i i can see gustafson maybe getting a bit of a raise um i think forboard's gonna have to take a discount just because of all his injuries i can see him doing a one year at just under two to about two just because i i don't know as a team i would want to lock him up for three years at three million with the injury riddle yeah. season he's had. I could see them saying, let's bring him back for one year at, you know, one eight, two million. Um, but even two million is expensive for your third pair guy. Like I could see maybe offering him one five and say, we'll do one year, one five, stay healthy. We'll talk after that. Yeah. It just depends, but I, you know, it, I'll, we'll have to have this conversation after we see them play and how the rest of the flames rest of their season goes. <laughs> But it'll be interesting to see. And at least with getting these two guys, the Flames have no need to rush Valimaki back. So that's always good. Well, and not just Valimaki, but I think even when Gio comes back, he can play less minutes. And Brad talked about that today. You know, with uh, Gustafson being able to play on the PP, I wouldn't be surprised if we say see Forsberg on the PK. I think that you can really cut down on some of the minutes that the captain's playing. Yeah, and anything to ease off and hopefully like Hamnick's back at some point before the playoffs you know like it would help the captain's getting older and I think we can preserve his longevity by playing him less yeah and Calgary needs to figure out like post Giordano being the best guy on the team defensively well they have the answer it's Derek Forbort 
Yes. <laughs> um, one guy we did yeah. s- say goodbye to today, the trade nobody's talking about, Brandon Davidson sent to San Jose for future considerations, which pretty much means San Jose's GM is picking up the bill next time that uh, he and Brad go for dinner. This was a trade that Brad Living talked about today of they wanted to keep Brandon Davidson up here. They didn't send him back to the AHL before the deadline yesterday, which means he's not eligible to play in the AHL again this year. But because they have Forborn and Gustafson, they don't think he'll be playing. So they wanted to find a space for him to play. So this is pretty much a way of saying, let's give him away. Now, it's weird because Brad said if we put him on waivers, teams would have claimed him on waivers. And I'm thinking, well, that's essentially what happened here. Like, just, yeah. just wave the guy. Uh, I guess that they're wanting to do the guy a favor and a solid just because, you know. And I think that that goes a long way as well for player recruitment. If you treat guys properly instead of, you know, like throwing them on waivers. And, you know, it's just a nice thing to do instead of, you know, it's respecting the player as a person instead of, you know, like, ah, uh, Anybody will take you. Who cares about you? And down the road when the Calgary Flames are trying to make a deal for Kevin LeBanc out of uh, LeBanc out of uh, San Jose, and they say, remember that time you sucked and we gave you Brandon Davidson? Cough up, gentlemen. Wa- yes. We'll also give you a fourth, and that's our future consideration. So, no, I don't know. It's just you can't trade for nothing, so this is the way of trading for nothing. Yeah. And it, it's just a nice thing to do for Davidson. It is. So that way, you know, and it, it's one of those things that it, it's a minor thing, but it helps. And it's just like when, like, the Flames would sign guys from college and, like, guys like Spencer Fu and play him in the NHL, even though not necessarily an NHL ready prospect but it just uh well hey you signed with us we guaranteed you a shot in the NHL you got it thanks for coming and burning you the deal it, with two games yeah it, it's just one of those pleasantries that helps solidify the Flames organization as being you know respectful of players and you know actually care enough to follow through on things and you know a lot of teams don't do that and if that helps us sign somebody important down the road or you know facilitates things in a positive way it'll pay off for the flames so you know you just gotta treat people right and that it's an unheralded thing but you know it's nice to see the flames following through on that and it's good to see. The uh, the best tweet I saw about this today for what future considerations mean, somebody said, when Doug Wilson is on the golf course in Calgary in the future, he will consider ordering Boston pizza. Well, I think a lot of people consider ordering Boston pizza. That's all he general. promised, Matt. It doesn't say future order. It says future considerations. Uh, if it's I on see. the internet, it must be there true. So he will con- he will consider ordering from Boston Pizza, and then he'll go back to golfing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for those that don't know, um, our GM Brad Trilliving, his father Jim Trilliving, who you see on Dragons Den, is the owner of the Boston Pizza franchise. So it's not like Matt and I are sponsored there. It's just, it's I think it's funny to make Boston Pizza jokes once in a while. I saw that on Twitter and had to follow through with it. Yeah. So looking at the deals that were done today, and let's not get into deals that weren't done, but looking at the actual packages that went, was there anything that you look at and say, I wish the Flames would have paid this price? Like I know you've talked about uh, potentially bringing in Ilya Kovalchuk, and we saw that deal happen. Um, and anybody here that you look at and say, you know what, that was that was a good deal? Oh, the two Russians, obviously Kovalchuk, but it makes sense that he went to go hang out with his buddy Ovechkin, so I- I'm not surprised at all there, and um, the other is uh, Vladislav Nemestikov. I thought that was a good price. That, that was what, Colorado a fourth paid. that Colorado played? Yeah. And, and Nemestikov, Nemestikov can play either side. I like that deal. I would have liked him here. Yeah. But, you know, it happens. Uh, all the rest of the trades, 
like, I, I think Edmonton did well with getting Anathazio from Detroit, but, you know, the uh, two seconds, to me, like, that for that player, uh, that's not a good price, personally. Like, I would have been kind of disappointed if the Flames did that trade, but it makes more sense for Edmonton. Uh, just because he's fast and he can actually keep up with McDavid. You would be disappointed if Calgary gave that up, you're saying? Yeah. See, and I'm the opposite. Um, Andres Athanasayu, I think two seconds for him. He's 25. He has a, an RFA. Con- so, I mean, he's RFA next year, so he's controllable. I think two seconds is a little bit rich, but I would have been willing to do it, let's say, I would have been willing to do it if they if Dubé didn't look as good as he has recently because I think getting another young guy in the system would have been worth it. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that I think the Flames where they are in terms of like development of guys like Peltier, Dubé, Phillips, Mangiapane that like they have enough guys that are both upcoming right now and in the on the team as it sits that they need more guys coming through the pipeline and I think that having the second round picks is actually better for this team moving forward than a guy like Anathazio and he's good like don't get me wrong but I I just don't think that where we are right now that it would have made sense. I also think that my mind would be different if I didn't think a big deal was coming this summer. If I thought they're going to stand pat, there's a good team, it's a cheap way to bring in a guy that we know we've got out of him. You know what? Maybe I would have wanted to go with it, but I think, and I've said this before, I think Goudreau might get moved on the draft floor this year, and if he does, I think that we can easily replenish some of those young assets that way. Yeah, it'll be... I think that what we have to see is how this team responds. Like, uh, frankly, this was a vote of confidence in the players yep. by Tre Living, and saying, "Okay, I could have easily sold it and gotten a a hell of a lot for a bunch of the guys, but you know, I think that you guys are good. Show me, and if the Flames." frankly suck miss the playoffs or lose in the first round then i think you're gonna see a larger change in the off season a more widespread thing but if the flames like they have a good run to the end of the season make the playoffs win a round or two or more then i think that you'll see them like say like the Taylor Hall thing or some other permutation of getting another higher end forward will come at the draft and go from there. Obviously the Flames probably didn't want to move a third pick, but one deal I would have been okay to make was the deal that Buffalo and New Jersey made for Wayne Simmons. I don't think he's your top guy, but if you're looking at this as a playoff team, I think at 24 points this year, Simmons could be a good depth right winger, which we know we need, we just need any right winger right now. And uh, Simmons was sold for a fifth-round pick this year. That's a deal I would have been okay to make for Wayne Simmons. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that would have been a viable trade, but unfortunately... I I think that if the Flames had Geo and Hamannick healthy, this would have been a very different-looking deadline. Yeah, I think that the Flames really would have went after guys to help out up front, and we would have seen like a top six forward and that's when i could see the sort. simmons deal or even the uh you know the Ilya kovalchuk deal or i could have even seen the flames at that point making a bigger sort of like the uh the deal we talked about earlier that edmonton detroit did for a rfa guy like i think yeah you would have seen a lot more a lot more forwards i shouldn't say more forwards i don't think they would have done more than two or three but i think you would have seen a bigger splash in the forward ranks yeah and I think it partially also has to do with how good Manjapane and Dubé have played recently. And that, Tree did say that, that too, as well, that they were trying to give those guys a vote of confidence. Yeah, and Ypres the third star of the week, so, you know, you have to give him some credit for that, and hopefully he's starting to get more and more comfortable at the NHL level and can contribute on a regular basis. 
So looking at the deadline overall and how it affects the Flames, do you think that the balance of power in the Pacific Division has shifted at all? Do you think there's any team now that we need to watch out for more than we thought we did yesterday or that, you know, maybe if it comes to a playoff round, you've got to say, oh, wow, these guys are significantly better now. I think Edmonton improved themselves significantly getting Anathazio and Ennis. Um, I don't think Edmonton's really a danger to do much in the postseason, but I think that it would be hard to beat them now. I honestly expected Edmonton to go and do a goaltender, whether that was um, Leonard or I was half expecting just because of Ken Holland being from Detroit that they were going to try and make a play for Jimmy Howard. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that uh, I that their whole team is basically I'm going to outscore you. So I you know, it makes sense to get Anathazio and Green, two very good offensive guys, and like none of their players have any concept on how to play defensively. So I think this is Edmonton's it, year to say we're in the playoffs. When was the last time we were in the playoffs? Quick, bulk up and let's try to make some out of this. Yeah. And you know, hey, we're awesome. Yay. And there's only really so, so much they could trade because they only have so many assets that people want. So I, I think, again, you're right. I think Edmonton probably did the best on on this day in terms of changing their lineup. I think they brought in a top-line player, um, probably a second-pairing defenseman. I don't think it's going to change who they are all that much, but I think it just rounds them out for the playoffs. Yeah. like To me, based on what they've done at the deadline and their current status i think one two three in our division will be some permutation of calgary edmonton and vegas i think that vancouver losing markstrom for a bit because he hurt his knee uh that will be a bit of a setback there's a zamboni driver available true Uh, you know that the dreaded zamboni driver um, you got to wonder what Toronto's and, coach was saying afterwards, throwing his notebook around, saying you guys got beat by a 42-year-old Zamboni driver. Not only that, he's works for our organization. We're literally paying him to beat us. Like, yeah, uh, that it, it, it's perfect for it being Toronto. You know, like, they've been so inept for 53 years now, then, like, they can't even beat their own Zamboni driver. I kind of wanted to see a trade today. Like, I know (laughs) Hutchinson got traded, but I was kind of waiting for Toronto to trade a goalie to Carolina and say, here, we got your proper one. Yeah. Or even, like, the third-string ECHL guy for considerations. Here you go. We got you a real goalie. Um, No, I agree with you about the Pacific. I think... Vegas made their team better by bringing in Robin Leonard. Going down the stretch, I would not want Malcolm Subban in my net. Should something happen to, um, to yeah, Flurry. I don't think Leonard's necessarily a long-term solution there, but going to the playoffs, I think he gives them some depth. I think Edmonton improved themselves enough that they're not going to fall out of the playoffs. I was, and I said this on the show before, I was half expecting Arizona to try and deal Taylor Hall. Um, they didn't do anything. Winnipeg didn't really do anything. I think you're right. You see Vegas, Edmonton, Calgary in one, two, and three of them Pacific. And I think the the deals that the Flames made today is going to help their back end. Yeah, and you know that's not to say that like say like Yellison was bad or Davidson were bad. But they were adequate NHL defensemen. But you know Forbort and. Gustafson are better. I would be a little so hesitant if Yellison or Davidson had to suit up for the Flames in the playoffs. And oh, for what sure. happens if you get one more injury? Knock on wood. What if Brody goes down or Hannafin goes down? Like then you're bringing up what Renat Valiev? You needed some. You needed some depth there. Yeah, and that helps. So we'll see. And plus, with uh, you know, now they don't really need to have Valimaki play, and maybe they just keep Valimaki out for the season. <laughs> now, Matt, when when and the Flames went out and got two defensemen, did it feel to you like something big was going to happen? Like I almost, when I looked at this, no. I thought Gustafson comes in, Forward comes in. I thought, are they setting something up to move Brody? And I thought maybe they just ran out of time. Yeah, no, I thought that 
there just being confident. I actually wasn't expecting the Flames to make a any trade today, so I think that them getting a couple of higher quality depth defensemen helps. I called it last week that we were going to get a Fandenberg-like defense, and I don't think you can get much closer to a Fandenberg deal than this deal. Yeah. I mean, it was and, a fourth to you know, LA. It's good. Yeah. Um, and Forbort, if he's healthy, like, honestly, both guys being 27, like, if the Flames can re-sign them both, like, those guys fit right in, in terms of, like, the timeline for all of the rest of the guys that are on the team. So, you know, like, for a competitive window, it's like, that would be a very good group to have moving forward. Because, like, you have guys like Hannafin... Anderson and uh, Shillington, who are younger, and Valimaki, who are younger, and those guys could be kind of your veteran-ish depth guys moving forward, if that be the case. So let's play coach here. Let's assume that you're the Flames coach, and you're setting the lineup. Based on where we are now with uh, Giordano and Hamannick out of the lineup, what do your pairings look like with these new guys in the lineup? Uh, uh... Hannafin Anderson uh, being kind of like the default first pairing. Um, probably Forbort Brody uh, being number two, and then Shillington with uh, Gustafson as your third Interesting. pairing. Interesting. See, I would I would agree Hannafin Anderson number one. I think I would. Yeah, or Shillington with Brody would work too. Yeah, I don't know if they want to put Shillington that high up the lineup. Um, yeah. It's kind of one of those where it's tough because, you know, it, yeah. <laughs> I think I would... You're, you're going to get somebody playing higher than they should I be. think I would go to start with Hannafin Anderson. We've seen Brody Stone. I don't think Stone is the right guy to be that high up. So I would go Hannafin Anderson. I'd actually go Brody Gustafson and then Forbort and Stone or Forbort and Shillington, depending on what you want to do. I just think based on what we've seen... Gustafson can probably play those minutes right now at that level, and I think him and Brody, if Brody can be a little more defensively responsible, is probably the the better pairing. Yeah. What about when uh, Gio and Hamannick come back? Well, Giordano takes his spot on the first pairing with Brody uh, with Anderson. Oh, with Anderson. Yeah, or Brody. It depends. Um, Do you go back to then Hannafin Hamannick as your second pair? Well, it it's tough. I think that, yeah, I think Brody with Geo makes sense, and then keep Hannah and Anderson, and then probably Forbort and Gustafson with Shillington being number seven. So where does Hannah and or Hamannick fit in there? Well, Hamannick he's uh, out for a while. Yeah. I, I think Gustafson, you might see him draw in up front if they want to keep him in the lineup. You know what, though? I think uh, one of the nice the things is we can rotate these guys in and out. So sort of like sometimes you see Ronaldo go in when they need a heavy defenseman. I think you'll see Forbort in that. Or, sorry, they put Ronaldo in when they need a heavy forward. I think you'll see Forbort go in when they need a heavy defenseman, a guy who can hit a little bit more. And I think in the playoffs, you can honestly rotate a lot of these guys around. Like, you obviously want to give Anderson and Shillington some time. Um, but I, I think it lets you, it gives you some different options. Yeah, I think Forbort, like if the Flames make the playoffs, that Forbort plays every game. Yeah. I, Just because you need that physicality. Well, and that's where I think the Flames would be willing to take Shillington out if they had to, to put one of the one of the veteran guys in. Yeah, I agree. So, Matt, every year you talk to us about one of the defensemen you want to move to forward. Do you think this year your guy is now Gustafson? Well, it's one you of those. You mentioned Shillington in the past. The have eight, we have eight guys that play defense. So, you know, if nine if everybody's healthy. So, you know, you can throw Gustafson. He's a very naturally skilled player. So, you know, I've seen worse options. Or so, take Reader you know, out of lineup Florida's, and run uh, eight, seven defense. Yeah, well, uh, I've seen uh, with Florida, they've played a couple of defensemen as forwards at the same time. Their fourth line, they literally have, like, just the center and two defensemen. Are they short on guys? No, they just do that sometimes. Okay. And it actually works rather well, and it's kind of weird. But uh, actually, Mark Pisk uh, had a hat trick uh, for them wow. 
as a forward, even though he's a defenseman. So they're short on guys. It's we got Robinson. We got, you know, Quine. We got guys we could sell. Well, they got to do things different. You know, other teams listen to me, you see. You know, they try the for- defenseman as forward thing, and it works. Just Calgary doesn't listen to you. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't see it happening unless the team's really desperate. Um, what I can see, though, is playing Gustafsson more, I don't want to say as a forward. He'll still be a defenseman, but I can see, for example, the face-off dots lining him up as a forward or letting him cheat almost all the way to the hash marks. Like I can see them giving this guy a lot more offensive opportunities. Yeah. And, like, honestly, you could roll seven defensemen and with 11 forwards and having him only being out there for power plays and, like, offensive zone, like, if you need offense type of I'm thing. I'm just looking like, like Go- you could go Gustafson needs a defensive partner, and I'm not sure that I'm quite ready for Stone or Shillington to sort of, I don't want to say clean up his mess, but be the defensive guy on the ice. I think you've either got to put him with Brody yeah. or Anderson to make him most effective. Or Forbort. Even. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I just I think forward being a heavier guy, I'd rather have him out there with someone not as offensive, someone who can who can still play defense but isn't the grinder. Yeah. I would actually like to see the Flames at some point try Giordano and Gustafson together. Yeah, I think not saying I'd want that to be our forever pair, but we see great things out of Brody or anyone who plays with Gio, and I I'd be curious to see what we get out of Gustafson there. Why not? So with that in mind, we are talking about defensemen. We actually have an injury report. Uh, Mark Giordano is back in full practice today in Boston. He was taking uh, contact, I believe, so back full full time. He could be ready, it's being said, as, as early as tomorrow's game in Boston or Thursday's game in Nashville. They brought him on the road trip. Brad said he was probably going to play. I kind of thought that was just posturing because if somebody knows your without your defenseman, prices go up. But... It looks like he could be back in the lineup, so that's nice to hear. But yeah, I I still think it's posturing. I I'd be somewhat surprised if he's back this week. I think if they went out and got an Oscar Fantenberg like defenseman, he'd be in this week because they need him. I think with Gustafsson and Forbort, you can buy yourself enough time to make sure he's really healthy. Yeah, and we have enough good defensemen now that we're kind of fine for the time being. And, you know, you just have to wait for those two guys to get healthy and get out there again. And Hamannick is now week to week, so I don't think he's going to be back anytime soon. I think, again, with Gustafsson and Forbort, um, I think that this will buy the Flames some time with him, and I think he'll be back by the playoffs, but I don't think you see him much before that. Matt, do you think we'll see Yusuf Valimaki this season wearing a Calgary Flames jersey? Well, I think that... In terms of the expansion draft, if Valimaki plays in either the AHL or the NHL this season, that the, he burns his eligibility and we'd have to protect him. And I don't know about you, but I think that there's not a huge rush to get him back. You know, now especially. Like, it, it'd be different, like, if the Flames, say, were in the playoffs and ran into like four defensive injuries and you need a body, uh, then you would probably throw him in there. But th- I don't really see any need for him to rush back now and maybe just play out the season and just, you know, not have him play. I don't know if they'll go without him playing. I think he'll be assigned to Stockton and with them being number yeah. one in their division, I think he'll play there. Yeah. Oh, I think that he'll be in Stockton if he does play. I just I I think that with that eligibility for the expansion is that draft, only for regular season games? I don't know, but if it was up to me, I just kind of say, yeah, well, you know, it's better than having to lose somebody better for nothing just so you can play a couple of games at the end of the season. Because you'd rather protect like, Forbort. Well, no, you can only do, like, three defensemen and seven forwards, or four defensemen and four forwards. And, like, obviously you're going to protect Shillington, Anderson, uh, Hannafin, and, if necessary, Valimaki. So, you know, you don't want to go that route if you don't have to. 
The f- if we look at the um, at the Heat schedule, they have about 15 games left. It looks like I can see the Flames. I mean, Velimaki is like you said; he's able to clear waivers to go up and down. He does have that weird eligibility requirement. I can see them send him down there. I mean, again, they're going to take their time on this guy, but I could even see him go down the end of the year for his three-game conditioning stint or whatever in the AHL, which I doubt would burn the year. Um, but they're also very high on this kid. Like, they see him. If you listen to Brad t- today, he talked about, you know, you're without three top three defensemen if you look at Uso. So I think they'd be okay to protect him. But I don't know. It's tough, Matt. I think with the Flames going to the playoffs – or sorry, the baby flames going to the playoffs and the flames going to the playoffs. I think, yeah, you send him to Stockton, you let him play out his time there, get his feet under him and try again next year. I just, I wonder if zapping the whole year is the right idea. Yeah, it's, could they send, it's just tough. could they send him the E? Probably. Could they I don't put him in know. Can- I mean, I, if you haven't played all year, maybe Kansas is the speed you want to play at. Good old scrambly yeah, well, ECHL hockey. Yeah, well, it's one of those things that, like if there's no eligibility things with the that I by all means send him to Kansas and let him have fun down in the E. Send him for his three game conditioning in Stockton. Send him down to the E, then bring him back up to Stockton for the for the playoffs. Yeah. Can you imagine he'd be the best defender in the ECHL? Oh, even by with his far. bum knee. Yeah, he'd be a freaking all star. They'd convert him to forward and he'd score all the goals. You can just play it, do whatever you want, you. So you're just the best player in the entire league. If so you were coaching down there, you just hire a bunch of guys who can play a little bit of everything. And somebody go stand on the blue line. Okay, your defense this shift. Yep. That's why Matt doesn't coach down there. Well, Matt. Well, you see, what you do is you get you sign 20 defensemen, and you just have your entire team be defensemen. You, you'll never get scored on. You might not never score, but hey, that doesn't matter. <laughs> so Matt's looking at the Oilers playbook and saying, let's do the opposite. Yes, exactly. We, they don't know how to play defense. You know, that would be like the ultimate matchup. The team that's just all offense, no defense versus a team that's literally all defensemen. <laughs> and then your goaltender would score. Yeah, no, sure, why none not? None of your D Bizarro, guys, your goalie would be the yeah. most offensive player. Well, hey, you know, when you're in a week where the Zamboni driver gets a win against the, the Maple Leafs, anything is possible now. You're, you're going to go and find some old, uh, not only current defensemen, but some old defensemen who are in their 40s and 50s and put together like an ECHL seniors team. Yeah. Once you win that. Chelios, what are you doing? Once you win their cup, you'll go for the Allen Cup. Yeah. Um, well, Matt, I guess the question to ask about this team, seeing where they're at, seeing what they've done this season, if you look really since the All-Star break last year, which is when the Flames really started to trend downwards after the great season, you look at the first part of this season, and I would say even to now, where they've had some good games, but they've had some okay games, are these Calgary Flames just a middle-of-the-road team who once in a while has a flash of brilliance? Well... I tend to not really look at where teams are in the standings. Uh, like it, it, like even like last year at the All Star break, like I was lauding St. Louis and saying that that was a team that I thought could make the playoffs, even though they were dead last, because they just had too much talent to be that bad. And Calgary, it's very much the same thing where this team has just too much talent to be as bad as they have been this season. And, like, just for pure roster skill level, Calgary is right there with St. Louis and Colorado as best in the West. It's just that pretty much every single thing has gone wrong with this team virtually all season. Where even if they just beat some of the bad teams that they've struggled with, like L.A. and Chicago, and did what you know everybody else does with L.A. and Chicago, the Flames could be right up there with St. Louis right now. But when you're saying but, everything goes wrong, it's not like they've had injuries, not like they've had guys get hurt. This is purely, I think, between the ears of the guys in this roster. Yeah, exactly. Like that. Well, you've seen like a draw and Monahan, and they've been for them awful this season 
And, you know, like I think they're both having their worst seasons, at least since they've been teammates. I think Monaghan's first season was worse than this. But, you know, like, it's not... Like, you come to expect a certain level of play, and, like, we've seen that from Gaudreau this past week, where he's looked a lot more like himself. And, uh, you know, like, if those guys are playing at the level that they're capable of, then, you know, like, there's no reason why this team shouldn't be... Like, it, it's not like this team has major structural deficiencies, like, say, the Oilers with not having any depth or defense or, you know, like, a lot of things. And, like, this team, they have a very competent defense core. They have adequately decent goaltending. They have a good top six, a good bottom six. Like, there's not really anything that's a glaring, like, oh, you're, you're missing, like, you don't have a Ginla type of thing. And, like, the rest of the team is just awful, and you only have a Ginla, or, you know, you need that extra star player. Like, Calgary has everything they need. It's just a lot of in-between-the-years problems and so do you think getting that they're pulling a, in the same direction. So do you think they're a good team that's underperforming, or do you think they're a mediocre yeah. team? I think they're one of the best teams in the NHL, and I still do, and I still have felt that way all season and that they've just been underperforming all season. I think on paper, as you said, structurally this is a good team. I think there's definitely some holes, and I think they'll address those holes. I think there's some guys who are maybe passengers or being asked to do more than they should on every team. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I don't think this is the best team in the league. I don't think this is a consistent Western Conference champions team like we see last year, but I think this year is a year that – everybody's underperforming and I think with most of this same core next year we, you know we can debate coach changes another time but with most of this same core next year I think you'll see a better result yeah and I got that's like back when I was saying like the Flames should look at selling for this year it was not like, oh, we'll trade Gaudreau and Monaghan and, you know, or anything like that. It was trade-off expiring contracts and some of the depth guys. And just to get different bodies in there. And, like, we have kind of saw that today. Like, y you get Forbort and Gustafson, who are basically younger, cheaper versions of Brody and Hamannick. And, you know, that makes... You know, it's an interesting way of being able to see if those guys are adequate enough to be able to replace the guys already existing on the team. And I think we're going to see a big move as well to bring in another top six forward. Yeah, same here. Uh, like, I would be... Frankly, I would be shocked if the Flames did not get another top six forward. It doesn't have to be a star guy like Taylor Hall, but... You know, like, just somebody who's a legitimate, like, in the same caliber as guys like Lindholm, Kachuk, Monahan, Goudreau, and even to a lesser extent, Backlund. Somewhere in that, between those tiers, another guy like that. I would be surprised if come uh, drop of the puck next year for the regular season, Goudreau is still a flame. I think not that I wouldn't be. Not that I think it's you know he's a bad player, but I think now if you want to move for a big piece like a big right winger, you, now's yeah. the time to maximize the value on that asset. Yeah, I could see that. It would depend. Like, I think they see Kachuk as I'm being able to be of, that number one left winger. Yeah, it's one of those where you'd have to find the right team, and like honestly, the team to me that make would make the most sense if you were going to do that would actually be the New York Rangers. But, um, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see. You know, I don't know how this season's going to turn out. And, you know, like, if Goudreau can... Like, how would you say, this year he has had problems adjusting. And, like, we've seen that on the breakaways. Like, for years he was basically able to do one of, like, two or three different moves, and he'd consistently score doing those two or three different moves. 
And now, like, goalies have figured out that, oh, he just does one of those things, so just don't give him those options, and you've made the save, and now he's not scoring. So I think that he just needs to change things up a little bit. And, like, we saw that with that goal that he scored against Detroit, where he picked the corner and took a slap shot instead of, you know, trying to finesse things. And I think that... You know, if he can make those subtle adjustments that he'll be just like he is. I think Calgary just needs to be more of a scoring by committee type team. And instead of just relying on Goudreau or just Monaghan or just Kachuk or just... Yeah, Lincoln. no, I totally agree. And like I said, I'm not saying, you know, Goudreau's had a terrible year. Let's move him. But I look back at, you know, the return we got for Jerome and stuff like that. And I think if you're looking at this guy is at the top of his game, one year removed from a 90-point season... Um, I think now you might look at him and say, you know what? It's not that we don't like him or he's not good, but let's maximize our return on the asset. Yeah. You said New York. I could actually doing a deal with Philly for Konechny and something. Yeah. There's lots of East Coast teams that, you know, because like, the whole Metro Division's murder central. Like, New York is at 70 points, just like Calgary is. And yet they're seventh in their division, so you know, and they have no hope of the playoffs. And I think that in the po in the draft, it gives you a lot more time to chat to figure things out. Like that's why that's not a deadline deal, because if a deal like that gets made, it's a hockey deal. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll see, but I I wouldn't be surprised if Goudreau moves this summer again. Not because he's a bad flame, but I just think that you know if you look at Kachuk as potentially number one, which I think this organization does. Let's maximize our return on the asset. Yep. You could get almost anything oh, you want for just, Goudreau. You get a new building for Goudreau. Yeah, it just depends on what's available, what the cost is, and all that kind of fun stuff. And there's always teams... Uh, that and I think, honestly, yeah, yeah, I think, honestly, like, Treliving is kicking the tires with everybody just to constantly, just to see what's available and all that, and... If it makes sense, it'll be done. The other thing I think would be really, you know, popular about Goudreau for another team is his contract. Six point seven five million. How many, you know, ninety point guys or first legit first line left wingers are you paying less than seven million to? Like I could see a team who's cash strapped or thinks they're gonna be cash strapped trying to take on that deal. I think Calgary could get something back because of that as a premium for hey, you got two options. Take the expensive guy or take our guy. Well, that that's the thing. Like you just saw, like the Islanders get Pajot for a first, second, and third, and you know uh, Barkley Goudreau, haha, uh, being uh, traded for a first just because he's under a Barclay cheap contract. Barkley Goudreau. Yeah. Um. So, so you know, like if Calgary did decide to sell Goudreau, like that they could get a lot for him just because of the cheapness of his contract just like when we picked up Hannafin like uh, or Hamannick I mean uh that a lot of the cost with that was that he was a very cheap defenseman for his level of play and I think that like I honestly a Hamannick I don't think would have been more than a second round pick had he not been a four million dollar defenseman and I know you're big on the flames bringing in Taylor Hall who's a left winger so in that case, would you say move Goudreau for a right wing or a center? Then you've got Kachuk and Hall as your top two left wingers. That would be a viable thing if you, especially because now like you know well in advance. I think like uh, two weeks before the draft, uh, that's when you can start talking to guys that you would know that oh well Hall wants like say seven point five or eight million dollars or something like that. Well, if and he's willing to come here for this many, and if those numbers are acceptable to you, do you then go, well, hey, if I do that, you know, and say, then can that put other things in play? And, you know, like, kind of like have a, you know, handshake agreement with Hall before the draft, trade Goodrow at the draft, and then sign Hall. It's doable. It just, yeah, it would... You'd have to have a lot of things because you you don't want Kachuk yeah. or Goudreau to be your your third line left, and I don't think either of them have done well the times we've converted them to right. So if you are going to bring yeah. in a Hall, I think at that point Goudreau's out of here. 
Yeah. It'll be interesting to see, but, you know, there's a lot of... We have to basically get through the rest of the regular season and the playoffs if the Flames make it to be able to start talking. Uh, you know, like, frankly, if the Flames miss the playoffs, I think Gaudreau and Monaghan are both out of here. And, like, this team is a severely different team next season. Even going into a partial, like, rebuild-ish with Lindholm and Kachuk being the two primary if guys. If these guys don't make the playoffs, for sure, I think uh, 13's out of here. Yeah. If they do, well, maybe they hang on to them a little bit longer. But, yeah, if they don't make the playoffs, I think there's there's going to be a lot of heads that roll. Yeah. Well, you talked about... I don't even... Th- yeah. You talked about getting through the season. Why don't we talk about this road trip the Flames have to get through? Um, we did yeah. our predictions last week. We only had two games, so it made it easier. And I finally won again. Nobody's won since December 2nd. Um, I won last week predicting we'd win in Detroit, lose to Boston. You were a little less optimistic thinking we'd lose both games. So I now lead this year 4 nothing. I don't think there's been a year you've won this game, Matt. No, I really do suck at this game. Maybe next week, maybe next year we'll just retire this game and assume I'll just be the champion. We'll, we'll yeah. give me a belt like the wrestlers wear that I can wear every time we record. Yep. Um, we got three game or four games on the docket tomorrow night, uh, Tuesday night. The Calgary Flames play at 5 p.m. in Boston. Then on Thursday night, a 6 p.m. start time in Nashville. Saturday night at 2 p.m. Mountain Start Time in Tampa Bay, and then the back-to-back on Sunday, another 2 p.m. in Florida. So four games, um, all against, well, three against Eastern Conference teams, one against a Western Conference opponent. Matt, how do you think we're going to do? Loss, win, loss, win. So you think we lose to Boston and we lose to Tampa Bay? Yeah. And we, you're saying we're winning against Nashville and Florida. I think that all of the games are going to be bizarre this week. Like, I don't expect, like, every game being, like, a 3-2, like, a normal... I You know, I, I'm expecting, like, a lot of offense from the Flames and just weird things happening. I don't, you know, it just seems to me that... Like, especially when we go to both Tampa and Florida, the those tend to be just some of the most bizarre games period like i remember that 9-6 loss to tampa that one year and like we usually have like 6-5 games against the panthers so yeah just expecting weird stuff to happen this week i'm gonna go a little bit different i think the flames are gonna have a good week i think they'll beat nashville tampa bay and florida and lose to boston Mm -hmm. what would you do for your goaltending uh starts this week uh, Riddick yeah. started last game against Detroit. Before that was uh, Talbot against Boston. Do you go back to Talbot for the second Boston game? Frankly, I yeah, I think you. Talbot's been the better almost, goaltender as of late. Yeah, it's really tough. I think that you might go Riddick against Boston just because. Shows different. Yeah, and then if. Riddick wins, then give him Nashville. If he doesn't, then switch back to Talbot. Yeah, I, I was thinking the same at first. I thought, well, we see them twice in a week. Let's show them a different goaltender against Boston. I think if it was me not looking at wins, I would go Riddick against Boston, Talbot against Nashville, Tampa Bay, and then Riddick on the back-to-back against Florida. If Calgary thinks Riddick is their guy for the playoffs, now's the time to give the other guys some play time and give Riddick some rest. Yeah. We'll see. It, I think that you just have to get through the Boston game, and that'll inform a lot of what the rest. Riddick hasn't looked of the good on the road like. this last little bit. Oh, Riddick hasn't looked good. Period. Since beginning of December, so it's you know one hopes that he bounces back at some point. But and there's two trains of thought. You could say it's play him in all the games to get him to bounce back, or Suns they just need to sit down and rest. So, I mean, yeah. you and I don't know. It's up to the goalie coaches. But I, I'm right now, with the need for points, I would go with the guy that we know, and I think that's Talbot. The guy we know can play better games. Yeah. Instead of being big save Dave, like, lately, it's been more occasional save Dave. That's right. So Bench-sitting Dave, <laughs> BSD. Yeah. Um, and if he's no good, well, there's a Zamboni driver available. 
Yeah. So we'll we'll see what happens. I think the goaltending might be the most interesting story this week as far as who is they go with. Um, we you know Talbot's had an up and down year for this team, but I think he's looked solid more often than not. And I think right now I'd be running Cam Talbot until he proves otherwise. I think you've yeah. right now I think you almost have Talbot lose the job rather than Riddick earn the job. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think, well, frankly, with the, how jumbled the standings are, Calgary just needs to get find ways of getting points on the board. Like, uh, uh, there's too many teams, like, right through 11th, frankly, that are right there. Like, if uh, Minnesota wins their next two games, they'll only be one point behind where we are now with an even games played so you know like it's tough and like calgary's in a bit of a hard spot right now and like there's only 19 games left and they need to it's basically a jump ball and they just have to be better the last couple weeks of the season than everybody else is right now yeah, and sometimes that's just going with what you know versus what you want or what you believe is the right thing is to go with the guy who's shown you they can do it. Yep. Well, Matt, I think that wraps up our trade deadline episode, another one in the books, and we'll see how these two goaltend or these two defensemen, Gustafson and um, number 56, number 20, how they both look this week. And I think, honestly, I think we'll see more out of Gustafson as far as being noticeable, but we'll talk next week and see what we think. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.